friends called him CJ. He was 19 years old when he started getting messages from this TV telling him to kill himself and kill his family. Just a couple months earlier, he'd gone off to college full of the hopes that he could change the world after graduating valedictorian. He started having problems concentrating in class and, and failed his first semester. His parents, knowing that something just wasn't right about their brilliant son, decided to take him to see his pediatrician, and then a neurologist, and then a psychiatrist. No answers. The only thing they did know that was CJ was in no shape to go back to school, so they kept him home from his spring semester of classes. One day when they were sitting at the kitchen table, CJ simply got up, walked up to his bedroom on the second floor, opened the window, and jumped. His parents were still at the kitchen table when they heard the crash outside in the bushes. CJ survived without major injuries, but his parents were terrified to leave him alone. His mom and dad took 12-hour shifts watching him. They didn't know what else to do. After the end of a week and a half, they were completely exhausted, and CJ was only getting worse. He was now seeing angels and demons. They were telling him that he deserved to die. The pictures on his wall screamed at him all day long. They were out of options. They knew they had to get him to a hospital. As they were in the car driving on the highway, CJ reached over, opened the door, and tried to jump out. His mom, who just happened to be sitting in the back seat next to him, grabbed his arm, reached over, and closed the door. It was the longest drive of their life. They finally made it to the emergency room, and after sitting in a hold for two days, they ended up on my inpatient psychiatric unit. When I met CJ, he was terrified. He'd have long conversations with the walls, each one ending the same way with him pleading for them to let him live. I'd seen these symptoms before, and so I started CJ on an antipsychotic, and over the course of two weeks, he went being, from being critically ill to being severely ill. His parents were at a loss. Why wasn't CJ back to his old self? Well, all the staff on the treatment team knew the answer to that, and so did I. CJ had schizophrenia. So I, I, I took a, a deep breath and embraced myself, because you can never really anticipate how a family will react to hearing that news. For some, they treated it like a death sentence. For others, confusion. But CJ's parents responded in a way that I'd never encountered before as a psychiatrist. As soon as the word schizophrenia left my mouth, his parents froze. His dad looked at me and said, pick another diagnosis. Alzheimer's, depression. I, I, I took another deep breath and, and, and I said, I tried to explain schizophrenia, I tried to explain the symptoms, and finally, his mom said, Do Dr. G, she interrupted, Dr. G, you just don't understand. You don't understand, if you diagnose him with that, you'll ruin his life. You don't understand the stigma he'll face, the shame he'll have to deal with. But I did understand. I understood the stigma, and I understood the shame. My family has struggled with mental illness for generations. Three out of four of one of my parents' siblings has a diagnosis of schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, or depression. I remember what it's like to commit an aunt involuntarily when I was a graduate student. I remember what it was like to have a family member go missing, only to find them six months later in an alleyway on another continent hallucinating. So I understand the stigma, and I understand the shame. It's so palpable in my family that every time I give a talk, they plead for me never to identify them personally. I understand the stigma. I remember what it was like in my early 20s to wake up day after day, each day terrified that I myself would wake up hearing voices or hallucinating. And I remember when I hit 30 and I passed that critical window for developing a, psychiat a psychotic disorder. I remember that, that fear, when it, it translated to a fear that one day my, my children or my nieces or my nephews would be counted amongst the 20 to 30% of Americans that suffer from a mental illness every given year. See, it's, it's not curiosity for me. It's fear that drives me to study the organ that's most clinically linked to, closely linked to mental illness, the brain. The brain is an, it's an organ tiny enough to fit into the palms of both of our, our hands. It's made up over 200 billion cells. For centuries, philosophers and, and scientists have tried to understand how this organ generates behavior. We've learned a lot in that time. We've learned that there are differences in your left brain and your right brain when it comes to things like movement and creativity and speech. But what those early philosophers and, sci and scientists couldn't appreciate was that over half of those cells in the brain processed or directly created a force that they couldn't touch, 
and they couldn't see. Electricity. In, in, in fact, when, when I became a medical resident, I was blown away to learn that the best treatment for major depressive disorder, the most debilitating de disorder in the world, was putting electricity directly into the brain. You might actually be shocked to hear that this is still this treatment, what we call shock therapy, is actually used at academic medical centers all throughout the country. So as a, as a scientist, I, I, I've wrestled to this, and it'll bring me to this, this question that I'd like to raise today. What if mental illness is a disorder of electricity? Electricity is defined as a movement of charge. In the brain, charge is made up of chemicals, sodium, potassium, chloride, and calcium. Half those cells are able to move the charge back and forth across their surface to generate electrical pulses. For centuries, we've, we've thought about this idea of what this might mean in the brain, and these electrical pulses are clearly linked to chemistry. As psychiatrists, for the last 20 years, we focused on the chemicals. This is why you hear terms like chemical imbalances. But for a neuroscientist, the holy grail is understanding how those 100 billion electrical pulses in the brain generate movement and thoughts and feelings and understanding. That is the concept that we want to focus in today. That's the idea that we, we want to frame this around. What is that electrical nature? Now, if you want to understand this, you know, let's say we want to understand an electrical machine. One thing you might do is, is try to take it apart by pieces. So let's say we, we talked about something like a computer. You want to understand a computer, you might take it apart. If, if you're a, a young kid at, at home, right, it's called breaking things. If, if you're an older kid in the room, we have really cool terms for this. We call it reverse engineering. But it, it, it's the same principle at the core of it. And, and you might take it apart. You might touch the, the, the memory sticks and the hard drive. You, you might touch these pieces. But at the end of the day, you wouldn't get a great understanding of how this computer worked when electricity was flowing through it because you would have unplugged it before you took the computer apart, hopefully. <laughs> so this is the challenge. As we studied the brain, we studied the brain without the electricity flowing through it. About 100 years ago, a little under 100 years ago, scientists realized that when there's electricity flowing through the brain, you can see these little electrical rhythms on the brain we call these brain waves. And some scientists now think these brain waves serve as miniature metronomes that allow large numbers of cells to work together in the same way a conductor allows musicians in an orchestra to work together to generate beautiful music. And so the idea here is, can we start to think about what those metronomes might mean and how they're organized? The challenge is, we can't actually measure all of those little metronomes. We can't measure those 100 billion cells that are present in the brain. So I, I'm, a, I'm a scientist, I'm a neuroscientist, but I'm also an engineer. And, and I wrestled with this concept in graduate school. And as my advisor and I were sitting down, I, I'll frame that second idea, that the, the real core element of my talk today. What if psychiatric illness is actually dysfunction of these little electrical metronomes in the brain? that allow cells to work together. You, you can see here, I'll put on the stream, an example of what a metronome might look like. And we've got these four cells, two green and two red. And you can see how the green ones are timed to each other, and the red ones in the metronome allows the green and the red to time together. And at the bottom, you can see the brain wave. The brain wave works like the metronome. When it hits the top or the green, the green ones fire, or the bottom and the red, the red one fires. It allows all of these to work together. And now what we, what we found is that this process, this relationship between brain waves and cells firing actually occurs in humans, and it can be observed in the brains of animals as well throughout the animal kingdom. So the challenge then is if, if we can find these metronomes and we know they're in the brain, and, and we have this premise that these metronomes might be related to the emergence of mental illness, the challenge is can we figure out where these metronomes are broken and can we fix them? That's the work that we try to do in my lab. In my lab, we implant wires, each the size of a piece of hair, into an animal's brain. We can then record electrical signals all throughout the animal's brains. We can figure out where the metronomes or these, these clocking timing signals are working in the healthy animals, and we can figure out where they're broken. In the animals that have genetic mutations that give them symptoms that look like mental illness in humans. Finally, we've created tools, brain pacemakers, that we can then use to fix the metronomes in the animal's head. Now, I know what you may be thinking. 
a, a mouse isn't a human being. A mouse isn't CJ. A mouse doesn't feel sad. It doesn't feel guilty. It doesn't hallucinate. But that's not exactly the point. I believe that if we can figure out how to use electrical rhythms in the heart of a mouse to create new treatments for cardiac disease, we might be able to use electrical rhythms of the brain to create new treatments for mental illness, for people like CJ. So CJ managed to pull through. In some ways, he was fortunate. He had a loving family. He got good psychiatric care in early in his disease course, and he responded well to medications. But unfortunately, CJ's experience and story isn't how it works for many families suffering from mental illness. Simply put, the best available treatments we have simply aren't good enough. But what if we've been thinking about it the wrong way? What if mental illness is actually a disorder of electricity? Well, in the future that I see, science would have eradicated stigma and hope would have set shame aside. In, in, in the future that I see, our, our, our brothers and our sisters, our, our mothers and our, our daughters and our partners will have lived out their life's greatest dreams. Because in the future that I see, we simply won't diagnose mental illness by monitoring brainwaves. We'll cure mental illness by tuning them. Thank you.